From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Wednesday the 10th, 3 p.m. in London, 10 a.m. in New York, 30 minutes into the trading day in the United States from London. I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele, of course, over in New York. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Markets. Alex, we've got hot inflation and hot trucks to deal with today. Yeah, I'm really looking forward uh, to the Rivian I IPO. I mean, this is the biggest IPO uh, of the year, and we're going to be talking to the CEO guy. That's going to be super interesting. I, I think the question is going to become kind of how we can grow the company, how the company can grow, and what that natural cap is going to be uh, in terms of uh, producing these amazingly looking, very cool trucks, by the way. Yeah, uh, we're going to be speaking to RJ Scarringe uh, pretty shortly. Uh, that's going to be an interesting conversation. They do look cool. Uh, the question is, uh, will they be able to produce enough of them? That's always been the challenge Never. for Tesla. Uh, but this is a company that has huge backing. You only have to look at the Amazon backing uh, of Rivian to appreciate that there are certain inbuilt advantages for this company going forward. And that order yeah. that effectively they have w with Amazon going forward is going to be uh, a huge part of that. Yep. Mark, it's your side. We're looking at a flatter curve on the back of that inflation story. Yeah, I mean, some real, real chunky moves, if I can steal a word uh, from your vocabulary here. And we can all party like it's 1990. It's a good time to party. I had some pretty good hairstyling back then. Um, so the hot inflation is having the expected effect uh, on the market. It was hotter than expected. Uh, the S&P is a little bit weaker here, trading a teeny tiny bit heavy, but the utilities, healthcare, real estate, for example, they're leading the upside. No surprise, because look at what's happening uh, here to the bond market. A deep sell-off on the front end of the curve as the market re-rates in terms of rate hikes for the Fed, uh, adding a little bit more rate hikes in the back end around 2024, yields up by about seven basis points. And obviously that having uh, a serious flattener, uh, you have a, a, a bear flattener on the curve. You're at 98 basis points at one point on the twos and the 10. Uh, no surprise, dollar index getting a boost of three tenths of 1%. If you hike, if it's more hawkish, that is supposedly better uh, for the U.S. dollar. And gold finally getting a bid at that inflation hedge. It's been a wishy-washy, unreliable boyfriend uh, when it comes to being an inflation hedge. But now it's up a solid $28 uh, as it feels like maybe it were hotter than we thought and maybe it's a little stickier than we thought as well, Guy. Yeah, silver also on the move this morning. So the precious metals complex certainly reacting to this data. So let's talk about the data. U.S. inflation absolutely surging last month uh, with prices rising more than expected. Uh, the fastest pace in more than 30 years. Back to Alex's hairstyle in uh, 1990. I just left school. I was traveling from one end of Africa to the other. Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent uh, Mike McKee has traveled far and wide as well. Uh, he is out in San Francisco to walk us through this data. Mike, the number is hot. How will the Fed react? Well, they're on a tough uh, position, uh, Guy, because at this point, the Fed is insisting that this is all going to go away, but they can't tell you when. And then every month, they get a higher and higher number to deal with. We'll be talking with the San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly about that coming up on this show. But you're right. 1990 was the last time we saw CPI inflation this hot. Uh, we wonder what Alex's hairstyle looked like then. <laughs> 1991, the last time CORE was uh, this high. Uh, the headline pushed up by the usual suspects, gasoline and food. Gasoline up 6.1%. Food up 1%. Now, this is food at restaurants. And you can see uh, they are going up, up, up. And that's the thing that people notice. Now, the Fed's going to look at the core rate, but the core rate's getting pushed up as well. And one of the problems they have is that housing is starting to contribute to inflation. It takes a while because of the way it's calculated for housing to work its way into the CPI, but it is now up 3.1% and rising on the year. And that's not something that's going to go away quickly after we've seen all these reports from home builders that they're selling houses as fast as they can. So you're uh, looking at what the Fed has left, uh, and they have inflation well over target by a CPI measure, not as much by the PCE that they follow, but the PCE is probably going to rise too like this. Mm -hmm. What do they do about it? It's a supply problem. Is it a demand problem too? Can they slow the economy by raising rates? What kind of pressure is Wall Street going to put on? Those are all questions that really need an answer. We'll ask Mary Daly about that. I'm not sure that uh, 
the president of the San Francisco Fed will have a view on Alex's hair in 1990, but we'll get the other questions answered. Oh, my, we're going off the rails here. Uh, it was really cool. I showed you later. All right, uh, Mike McKee, thanks a lot. And we'll be talking to Mary Daly uh, at the top of the next hour, an exclusive uh, conversation with the San Francisco uh, Fed president. Meanwhile, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia is tweeting about the risks of inflation. In a recent tweet, he says, by all accounts, the threat posed by record inflation to the American people is not transitory and it's getting instead worse. Uh, from the grocery store to the gas pump, Americans know inflation tax is real and D.C. can no longer ignore the economic pain Americans feel every day. Let's get more insight now with Annette Markowska, uh, Jeffrey's chief financial economist. Annette, you're an economist. You're going to tell me ignore things like food, ignore things like energy. But in the real economy, those things make a difference and put the Fed in a real bind. What's your take? Um, I'm not going to tell you to ignore it because I do think while, you know, you could certainly make a case that there's a transitory component to these price pressures. Uh, we don't know when that goes away. But even when you go back to the labor market, we think that the labor market and what we're seeing in the wage dynamic, unit labor cost dynamic, explains up to about a percentage point of this elevated inflation. So even if we assume that these bottlenecks are resolved, whenever that might be, presumably in the middle of next year, uh, I just don't think we're going back to 2% inflation. You know, the best case scenario is that maybe we go back to 2.5%, 3% range. That's what, that's what wages are telling us at the moment. What comes next uh, on the inflationary train, Annette? We, we've clearly had the effect of the supply bottlenecks. Energy prices are going up. We're certainly seeing that around the world. But energy prices feed into food price inflation. They're a huge input into food price inflation. Um, we are going to see a return of airfares as an expensive item and a rising item. I, what comes next in terms of keeping this inflationary narrative alive, do you think? So I think the next three to six months, we're going to see continued um, pressures. You know, it, it's just going to it's going to be hot, basically, in the rental market, uh, as you know, you talked about more pressure there. When you look at market rent indices, they've been rising at a pace that's consistent with you know, not 0.4 increases in rents and OER and a CPI, but something more consistent with 0.7, maybe even 0.8. So there's more upside there. Um, core goods inflation. I mean, we're this is the beginning of the holiday shopping season, right? Supply is absolutely constrained, and seasonal demand is going to go much higher by December. So presumably those shortages of products will become even more intense. Um, and then you're absolutely right. I think the travel-related sectors, which are clearly bottoming, uh, could experience even more pressure as well. We just lifted the ban on European tourists uh, a few days ago. Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that should lead to a pickup in demand. So I think the next three to six months you have to expect more pressure. And I think there's a good chance that we actually see a five handle on core CPI um, as early as December. Wow. Okay, now that's going to be seriously hot uh, headed into 2022. Um, so the market currently is pricing another 13 basis points of rate hikes by mid-2023. Is the market too complacent in that? So this is where it gets tricky, I think, with the liftoff, because the Fed obviously has uh, laid out a, you know, what they call a very stringent test that talks not just about inflation, but the employment situation. And and I think we can all agree that we're not quite at maximum employment yet. It's a debate where maximum employment is at the moment. Um, and, and I think that getting back to the pre-pandemic employment to population ratio is just a, too ambitious of a goal that the Fed will probably have to abandon at some point. I just don't think they're ready to throw in a towel anytime soon. I think there is another response that the Fed um, uh, that the Fed can go toward, and that's just accelerating the taper. I think it's a much more logical response when we're not quite there on the labor market, but clearly there on inflation. Um, we're going to have another CPI um, uh, report by the December FOMC meeting. It's, it's probably going to be another hot one. And I think there is a growing probability that at that meeting, the Fed accelerates the rate of tapering, maybe even doubles it, which would put them on track to finish by March as opposed to June. And you wonder whether, therefore, that then brings forward the first rate hike. Annette, this is uh, a, a hot subject. Uh, it is going to be debated widely. Thank you very much indeed for giving us your thoughts. And then Mokowska, Jeffrey's chief financial economist. Coming up, Rivian.
hitting the public markets today. Uh, the company certainly looking to make a dent in the EV space. RJ Scarange, Rivian CEO, joining us next for an exclusive interview. This is Bloomberg. I'm not sure what the hottest number is today. It's either the inflation print we just had or it's the numbers I'm seeing um, on Rivian. The indicated price has gone from 110 to 120 within the last couple of minutes. Uh, it is, uh, a, let's call it a circa $12 billion IPO. It's absolutely massive. The price is indicated uh, that it could be super hot uh, as it comes out of the gate. We think that's going to happen somewhere around 12 Eastern. Ed Ludlow is with the CEO of Rivian. Ed, what a day. Yeah, what an incredible day. What an incredible indication of the opening price. RJ Scarringe, Rivian founder and CEO, congratulations. Let's just kick it off by asking, what does today mean for Rivian and for Rivian's future? Yeah, it's an exciting day. Uh, you know, for us, this is this is the result of lots and lots and lots of effort uh, from a variety of different folks, you know, across the whole business. And for us, we've we spent years and years putting this together. And really, what's so exciting is seeing such a diverse group of people with diverse backgrounds and and interests really coming together uh, to create these products. And and you know, standing there today, looking out at the team as, as we ring the bell. Uh, it was quite emotional, you know, seeing seeing so many passionate faces. It was it was really powerful. So we're we're excited, and it, of course, this is the first step of of many uh, with us you know, becoming a public company and and now having the opportunity to really accelerate uh, a lot of our areas of focus in terms of scaling the impact that we can have with our products and and with what we're building. Right. To reiterate what's on the screen, RJ Rivian indicated to open at one hundred and twenty dollars a share after pricing at seventy eight dollars overnight. That's a big valuation. We'll do the math in due course. What is it about Rivian's technology and the company that justifies that valuation? I think as you look at our business, there's really two arms. We have a consumer side of the business and really the, the tip of the spear, the first products, uh, what we often think about is the products that will open the brand umbrella are, are R1T and our R1S. And, and they're really going into a segment that, that hasn't seen this level of innovation, this level of technology and really allowing us to build a brand around this idea of both inspiring, but very importantly, also enabling people to go do the things they love. And so we've we vertically integrated the electronics in the vehicle. Uh, we vertically integrated the software stack. We built a, a propulsion platform that's incredibly scalable. And a lot of that vertical integration on, the, on that platform has allowed us to go really fast on building out the commercial side of our business uh, with our first customer really also being a flagship much like the R1T and the R1S uh, with Amazon. And their initial order uh, being 100,000 of these vans, really allowing us to even further having uh, further have impact uh, in terms of how we electrify the full space. Well, let's dig into Amazon. Bloomberg reported that Rivian is prioritizing the production of the Amazon van. You're obviously on a deadline to deliver 10,000 by the end of next year, 100,000 by the end of the decade. How are you going to manage that? your own consumer products and the constraints of having to deliver for Amazon? Yeah, I think this is a misunderstanding. Uh, often when people look at the business, we've designed the company at its core uh, and really in part having these two different programs to create a forcing function for us to build and, and grow the ability uh, to be able to develop multiple programs at the same time and launch multiple products at the same time. So when you see the, the R1T and the R1S and, and the commercial van, these are different teams that are developing them, different launch teams, they're even different production lines. So the, 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 the van, of course, isn't built on the same line as the, the truck. And there, those, that separate team and that, that, a folk, that focus on discipline of building those separate organizations, of course, pulling from the same pool of resources uh, allows us to go very fast on two programs at once. And really the, the core of that is, is our desire to build out really our portfolio of products that's broad enough for us to achieve significant scale quickly 
and uh, to have as much impact as possible. Uh, that's, that's really the reason I started the company. It's, it's the reason we had some of our early pivots as we designed and iterated on our strategy was, was really in service to the question of, of how do we maximize impact. How critical has Amazon been to the various valuations the company's been assigned along the way, the credibility that Re Rivian's been able to build? Well, Amazon's been a, uh, just an outstanding partner. Uh, of course, they're a major shareholder, uh, but aside from that, and, and I would say uh, much more important than that is the collaborative relationship we have with them. And in the vehicles that we're developing on the commercial side, uh, what you see on the surface is, is a really friendly, easy to get in and out of, uh, very efficient, very easy to load and unload, a van that's optimized around last mile and has a whole host of applications. But what you don't see is all the infrastructure that we're building around that, what we call our fleet OS platform, uh, but essentially the, the ecosystem of services that we're able to wrap around the vehicle to make it very efficient to run and to be able to work closely with Amazon and, and understanding what the needs are for us to build that system has, has just been awesome. It's been, it's been really exciting and um, you know, working um, to understand how do, we, how do we find opportunities for efficiency, but also how do we make the environment for the drivers and the operators really comfortable uh, and something that they want to come into. So you've raised $10.5 billion in the private markets, I guess around $12 billion in the public markets. What are you going to spend that money on? <laughs> I, I think as, as you look at the scale of what has to happen as, um, as an industry, today there's, there's well over a billion vehicles on the planet. A teeny fraction of those are electric. And really over the next 10 to 15 years, we have to electrify that entire fleet. We have to replace you know, well in excess of a billion vehicles, gasoline and you know, combustion powered vehicles uh, with electric vehicles. So the scale of this is just, it's, it's in some ways unimaginably large. And it, it's gonna require multiple companies to be building multiple products, you know, portfolios of products that, that capture addressable market in different form factors, different segments. And for us, we're very focused on that. So what we're, right. you know, what we're looking at today is, is our launch products, but making sure we have the capital to continue scaling the business building additional production capacity for future products, uh, you know, continuing the development of those future products along with the technologies is, is really key. And, and we are really striving to help drive and lead uh, this, this massive transition that we're gonna have to right. see over the next 10 to 15 years. Bloomberg's reported you're in talks with the city of Fort Worth to invest $5 billion in a plant there. You're looking at potential sites for a plant in Europe, potentially the UK. What's the update on those please? We, we haven't made any announcements around our second facilities, um, second or third facilities. There, there's certainly a lot of uh, speculation, but it's, these are really important decisions. And, and for us, it really comes down to looking at the, the, the ability to recruit an outstanding team to come in and, and help drive and operate these, these facilities. So looking at the, the pool of talent that exists in each of these locations, these potential locations, as well as, of course, the access to the supply chain. Uh, so where our suppliers are and, and what the logistics looks like to bring, uh, bring components in. On the supply chain, you delayed the start of production on the R1T more than once. You know, you mm -hmm. talked about a shortage of semiconductors. Where are the pressure points? Is it in semiconductors, rising commodity costs, labor? Where are you seeing the choke points? I would say the biggest challenge uh, that we have, and I would say broadly across many industries, um, is, is really the health of the supply chain. And, you know, if you think about building a vehicle uh, like this, like our R1T, there's around 2,000 parts that come in from end item parts that come from suppliers. And this is one of those rare situations where a 99.5% is not good enough. Meaning if 99.5% you know, of the, the supply chain is ramping at the same rate of our production, but 0.5% isn't, that of course constraints, uh, creates a constraint or a throttle for how fast we can ramp the rest of the facility. And that's certainly the world that we're living in along with many others of, of managing what is actually a small number of suppliers, but, but working really closely with them, partnering with those, those organizations to make sure they can, they can keep up with our ramp. And that is a, that is a major focus for our team. And uh, we're fortunate to have some great folks that are on the ground working with those suppliers, uh, you know, making sure we get right. through this ramp phase. Rivian is subject to some litigation, two specific items the company has not been able to comment on because they've cited the quiet period ahead of the listing. The first being, a former employee and executive who has accused the company of gender discrimination and, and quote, a toxic bro culture. Could you respond to that, please? 
Yeah, we're, we're, we're not able to comment on anything uh, in terms of active litigation, but what I will say is the most important thing that we're building as a company, the most important thing is, is our culture, is the organization. And it's something that I spend a tremendous amount of time on. And we really focus on making sure the organization and the people that we recruit into the organization and our leaders across the organization are empathetic, are, are open, have humility, uh, drive collaboration. Uh, and of course, it's, it's a diverse set of leaders. Uh, so as you look across the business, we have uh, diversity in various parts of the business. And that's really important, really to drive diverse points of view and to make sure that as we think about making the, the thousands and thousands of decisions we have to make every week on the products and what we're building, uh, that those different points of view, those different backgrounds are, are coming right. together to, to, to make really high quality decisions and, and to create an environment where that continues. And, and that's something that uh, across the team we're, we're incredibly focused on. Tesla has accused you of poaching employees and in the process taking trade secrets. Is that the case? So today we're about 9,500 employees and we've, pull, uh, we've pulled our team together. Uh, we've come, as I said, from a very broad mix of backgrounds. So we certainly have folks that have come in from Tesla. We have folks that have come in from other automakers. We have, we have a very large number of folks that have come in from consumer electronics and, and the technology space. And you know, as part of that, it's, uh, it's really important to make sure that, that that mix of talent coming from different places helps provide that diverse point of view. Now, of course, when we bring people in from previous roles, uh, we make it very, very clear that uh, they're not to bring any of their previous, uh, previous work with them or any, anything that they'd uh, developed in previous roles in, in any company. RJ, oh, we're running out of time here. So much to discuss. Tesla's mission statement is to advance the transition to sustainable energy. What is Rivian's mission statement? Are, are you seeing yourselves going into similar fields where you leverage your tech in energy storage, batteries, things like that? Yeah, as, as we think about the, the transition we have to go through as a planet, it is, as I said, uh, very large. And the way we look at this, the lens we look at it through, is this is something where we really talk about keeping the world adventurous forever. And the key word I'll focus on there is forever. And it's such a powerful word because it, it's sort of, it, it's almost intimidating in that it causes you to think about not just ourselves or even our kids, but our kids, 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 and right. beyond. And so as we look at it through that lens, for us, it's a question of how do we as rapidly as possible transition ourselves away from a fossil fuel based economy? And that of course has a huge, you know, huge uh, focus on the, the transportation products, but it also includes energy products. And this is something that we will certainly get into uh, as, we, as we really drive to accelerate that. And as part of this, we've got to pull customers in. We have to get customers excited about the products and, and really our focus on products that enable and inspire uh, the kinds of things you want to take photographs of, you know, doing those kinds of things. That's the brand we're building. And, and we hope that that gets people excited about making this transition. All right, RJ Scarringe, founder, chief executive officer of Rivian. There's so many more things we need to discuss, but we'll save it for another time. Thank you for joining us. Congrats on the listing. Alex, I'll throw it back to you. Thanks, Ed. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much uh, for bringing that interview uh, for us as well. And just to update everybody on where we're looking at in terms of pricing, um, Rivian still indicated to open about $120, IPO priced at $78 a share. Uh, Guy, this would be about $12 billion uh, in terms of valuation and the sixth largest IPO on record, the biggest IPO of this year. Uh, I know that electric vehicles accelerate pretty quickly, but the rate of change in terms of going from a standing start to where we are now, absolutely eye-watering. Uh, it was interesting to hear some of the commentary coming from COP. Uh, a lot of money is flowing into the space right now. A lot of people are trying to figure out exactly where we are going to see success. Will it be Rivian? Will it be elsewhere? Mm -hmm. At the moment, the market is just like, we've got to go for this. There is no option. All in. Yep, and um, if you talk to those in the market too, they say we're not backing off from this and that even if somehow governments change their tune or subsidies become a little bit different, car companies have already transitioned, like they're already all in yep. uh, on this as well. Um, you can follow a tick by tick here with T Live. There's a great blog going on. Uh, check that out. We we'll follow everything about that listing. We'll also bring you any headlines that cross. Again, Rivian indicated to open at 120 a share. All right, coming up on the markets, uh, Katarina Simonetti, Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management Senior Vice President, will tell us why she sees an economic slowdown on the horizon that could actually be worse than expected. This is Bloomberg.
The number one economic issue is when interest rates go up, as they, they inevitably will, will asset prices come down and will it be more difficult to sustain all the values that people have had over the last year and a half? That was David Rubenstein, Carlisle co-founder and co-CEO, speaking uh, to Bloomberg's Danny Berger at the Super Return Summit uh, in Berlin. Rubenstein's also the host of David Rubenstein's show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations, that airs on Bloomberg uh, Television. So what does everyone else think of that? Uh, Katarina Simonetti, Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management Senior Vice President and Private Wealth Advisor, uh, joins us now for that. So at some point, interest rates rise. That's going to knock out all this value, uh, the valuations that we've seen to that point. I should point out that Rivian is indicated now to open 125. So talk about valuations. What do you think? Alex and Guy, thank you for having me on the show. Um, of course, you know, this market has uh, given us a surprise after surprise after surprise. And valuations absolutely matter. And as much as the retail investors and the markets tend to ignore the issues that we're seeing, such as higher material costs, supply chain interruptions, higher labor costs, you know, all of that eventually is going to translate into the earnings revisions, not to mention potential for higher taxes, higher inflation. This is the reality. And with that said, we see the consumer strongly supporting this market, and we think that this spending, strong consumer spending, is going to con continue throughout the end of the holiday season. But the question is, what comes after? And as much as the retail investor is so worried about taking money off the table too soon, in our opinion, what they should be worried about is the excessive risk to their portfolios. And this is the perfect time to gravitate towards defensive plays, to take profit, and to be in the sectors that are strategically positioned towards this more volatile market that presents a lot of challenges. Alex is going to chuckle and laugh at me now because I've been asking this question a lot, but I hear it a lot being asked by other people. Are you suggesting that you should not be fully invested at this point? Guy, absolutely. This is precisely what we're suggesting, but not to be fully invested. We are suggesting that we shouldn't be invested in exactly the same sectors that are disproportionately up. And this is the perfect time to evaluate our investment portfolios, see what sectors performed well, take some gains off the table in sectors like S&P 500, like Russell 2000, like certain parts of technology, and pivot to sectors that are positioned to do well in the following years, like healthcare, for example, where there's a lot of pent-up demand due to COVID. We're going to see this for years, like financials that are positively correlated to the higher interest rate environment. I mean, this is going to be a reality. Fed is about to start raising rates. We really like consumer staples. We're a little apprehensive about consumer goods, but we still like consumer services. So the point is, there's still a way to make money in this market. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be fully invested, but we should be doing it in a very smart, strategic way. Guy, I knew. I knew you were going to ask that question next. I think the mind melds today is complete. Uh, so, Katarina, City had an interesting call out the other day, saying that they're actually positioning uh, for a decline in inflation. Like, they see the peak coming, say, in the next three to six months, and they want to position for a decline in inflation. Does your thesis encapsulate that, or does it wrap in higher, uh, sus more sustained inflation? Alex, it's an interesting time when it comes to inflation. Federal Reserve, for example, you know, views it as perhaps transitory in nature. But in our opinion, we should consider the fact that higher inflation is perhaps here to stay, both higher inflation and higher taxes. You know, what we see right now is the increase in cost supported by higher demand. But we can't ignore the fact that it is also fueled by stimulus checks, by the fact that people had more money to spend because of the performance in the market and in the cryptocurrency. And going into the new year, is this trend going to continue? To come back to inflation, we actually think that inflation levels are going to be higher and perhaps they're here to stay. Do you think wages keep up with inflation? Your, your comments on the consumer being fairly healthy at the moment, um, it, it's certainly borne out by the data, but there is a gap currently between wages and inflation, there is uh, a squeeze on the consumer. Does that get, uh, uh, does that become a bigger problem next year? And if so, how does that work its way back into the market? 
Guy, it certainly is a data to watch. And the labor market is really challenging right now. We are on one side are seeing labor shortages and then pressures on wages. But what we are also concerned about is the decreased saving rates in this country. And we always say in almost every narrative that consumer is the driving force behind our economy. And we're, as we're seeing this rates of savings declining, this is something that could present a challenge, absolutely. I just want to point out, we're getting another read now on Rivian, indicated to open at 120. So it really does feel like we're bouncing around this 120, 125 level. Remember, uh, that stock priced at around $78 uh, dollars a share. Uh, Katarina, where does this leave your view on technology stocks, like the big tech names, where if you haven't owned them, you've just gotten really beaten up and you can't seem to beat your benchmark, really? What do you do? Alex, we're not ready to give up on technology yet. We, um, you know, the most exciting part about the world of technology is research and innovation and how much investment is being made into this technological development. You know, so we think that this is the time to be really selective about the technology plays. And technology absolutely should remain within the investment portfolios, but competitive positioning of, to, of select technology companies or sectors that we have in our portfolios are more important than, than ever. It, we have to evaluate the portfolios. And again, we're huge proponents of profit taking. This is the time where, where if you see the disproportional growth in certain sectors of technology you know, in our portfolios, this is the time to not abandon that sector, but to strategically take profit and reallocate to the parts of technology that sector that are going to continue to grow. And there is tremendous amount of opportunity there. And we think money is absolutely is to be made in, in technology. Where, where does that leave the, the headline index? I heard what you said about the S&P. I heard what you said about the Russell. As we get this rotation, does the index level come down? Guy, there is a time for investing in indexes, and then there is a time where the active management and very careful security selection takes place. And this is the time for quality. This is the re the time for de-risking and strategic positioning. So when we look at the positioning of this this sectors within the portfolio, you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, is there a competitive advantage? You know, is there a uh, the 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 price sensitivity? Activity, right? You know that that these companies can take advantage of, or is it something that that is disproportionately positions them uh, to not make a lot of profit next year? You know, this is the time for all these questions. So we believe that this is not ideal time for index investing, but instead yeah. rotation to quality and individual security selection, you know, would work much better in this market. Bottom up, not top down. Katerina, thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate your time and your analysis. Always thoughtful. Katerina Simonetti, Morgan Stanley, Private Wealth Management. Thank you very much indeed. We've got some oil data. Alex. Oh, yeah, of course. Here. So the reason why we, well, I always care about the oil data. But in particular, the markets are really expecting uh, a much needed relief build uh, for this week's reading. And we did get it, but it wasn't as much as we thought. So overall, crude builds came in about 1 million barrels. Uh, you did see, though, a draw and slight draw in Cushing. Um, gasoline inventories drew, distillate inventories grew. So you're, it doesn't really feel like we're out of the woods yet, but oil trading a little bit heavy. The EIA really uh, did help to put the kibosh on higher oil prices for the time being, said that we're going to start to see a surplus in the first half uh, of next year. So that could be more of what's leading the market. But we did get that build, uh, 1 million barrels of oil from last week. All right, coming up, Ursula Burns, uh, Integrum founder and former Xerox CEO, will be joining us from the Super Return International Summit. Looking forward to that conversation. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, an exclusive interview with Mary Daly, the San Francisco Federal Reserve President. That's at 11 a.m. in New York, 4 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Rishka Gupta. Bloomberg's learned that President Biden and China's Xi Jinping will hold a virtual summit next week. No specific date has been set. Ties between the world's two largest economies have quietly improved in recent months. Still, the U.S. and China have sped, sparred over Taiwan, and Washington is concerned about Beijing's expanding nuclear arsenal. 
And China is signaling it's unlikely to join a global pledge to cut methane emissions, saying it's already doing enough. A senior Chinese negotiator at COP26 climate talks accused the U.S of asking nations to pledge to cut greenhouse gases without offering solutions on how to tackle the problem. President Xi Jinping also failed to attend the conference, a move criticized by President Biden. Blue Isle Capital has emerged as one of the fastest growing and most disruptive players in private markets. The New York-based firm now boasts $70 billion in assets. Co-founders Michael Reese and Mark Lipschultz adapted a Silicon Valley-type business model for financial services. They spoke to Eric Schatzka for Bloomberg's Front Row. We said there is a chance to be that disruptor. And then we purposely built a business model that looked a whole lot more like a tech company than financial services. We didn't start and say, you know, our base model is a bank. Now, how do we become a better bank? You can watch the entire interview with the founders of Blue Owl Capital tonight on Bloomberg TV starting at 9.30 New York time. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg Guy. Ritika, thank you very much indeed. The Super Return International Summit is back in Berlin, back in person. It's the world's largest private equity and venture capital event. Uh, joining us now from the summit, Bloomberg's. Danny Berger. Danny, over to you. Guy, thank you so much. I, I am so pleased to say that we are joined now by Ursula Burns, who is the founder of Integrum Holdings. Uh, Ursula, thanks so much for joining us. Of course, it's, it's not just Integrum. You were formerly the CEO of Xerox as well. You're on many, of, on many boards. You have been on many boards. But of course, private equity is where you find yourself now. So let's talk a little bit about Integrum. Part of the core of Integrum, along with technology investing, of course, is diversity, inclusion, social impact. What does it mean to have this at the core of a firm versus a lot of private equity, which kind of tacks it on afterwards? Yeah, it's a great place to, to start. First of all, I formed the firm with, three part, with two other partners. The three of us were kind of like, let's say, mid to late mid-career. We had already done a whole bunch in our lives, and we found ourselves thinking about what we could do in the future. And what we thought was to try to actually change a little bit of the way that business building is done today. Business building is done largely in PE and VC firms. It's generally done by people who were born and raised to be in PE and VC firms. They think about it when they grow up, when they go to college, et cetera. We wanted to actually have a more diverse firm not just racial or gender diversity. We wanted experience diversity as well. I'm an operator, for example, was not in investing. We want age diversity. We want to diversify the vendor pool that we use, everything. We wanted to start from scratch, build a, a, a firm that had nothing before, literally the offices that we go in, who provides our copying machines, everything. It's broadening um, the access to people who were not in before. Right. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not an afterthought. It's not the kind, we're not taking something that's already running and trying to contort it to be diverse or equitable. We're trying to build it from the bottom up, and that's the, that's the difference, I think, with integrity. Right. And it's important that we're not a diversity firm. Right. We're right. an investing firm. We're going to be as good or better than investing firms out there. Certainly. We just want to do it in a different way. Mm, and, and it's a competitive environment out there right now. Absolutely. Of course, you started earlier this year. How, how have you found it so far? How has the environment been uh, on this project that you've embarked on? Yeah, it's really interesting that, you know, because of the approach that we're taking, our ability to get talent into the, into the pool of people that we're looking at is amazing. Mm. So young talent, we're a small fund, billion dollars. <laughs> small compared to the, yeah. the world out there. And so we can work on, we bring people in who can work on things with us from the beginning. So they literally younger people, mid-career people and senior people actually all engage around deals, all engage around staffing the organization, all engage in building the fund. So we found access to talent to be very, very good. It's a problem that other people are dealing with and struggling with. Fortunately, we're only hiring 10 to 15 people, not hundreds and hundreds, because that is a challenge. Mm. Talent is a challenge in the world today. Right, well, I mean, it's interesting you say that we're not a diversity firm, because unfortunately, often in this world, when you have a diverse firm, sometimes that's the label that gets put on it. I mean, unfortunately, you look around at a conference like this and you see that it is mostly white and it is mostly male. Why is this industry 
having such an issue? What are they getting wrong that this diversity question is very far from being solved? It's interesting. I think that they're getting the same things wrong that public companies got wrong for many, many years. I say that they're one cycle out. They're one cycle behind. And they have to get on it because you said it. You know, I'm standing in the or sitting in the hallway here, and I think I've seen. I'm the only person of color that I've seen, and there are very few women around. This can't. This is not sustainable. Obviously, all studies. You know, the, the facts are already in. The, the the die has been cast. You're more innovative. You have better better results. You're more future ready if you are diverse. You are you. You serve more people if you are diverse. So this ability to actually stay um, in the old white male club is not going to last very long. I think this is the next place that there'll be a turn in private equity and venture capital firms. We did a study in this thing called the Board Diversity Action Alliance right. that I started with some, I mean, just started, I started. <laughs> Me and a couple of people thought about this and said, why are there not more? Yeah. And it, we studied it and it's looked at numbers. just the performance. Yeah. It's unbelievable in public companies, then, but the progress has been made in private firms, in PE firms, and VC firms. It's an embarrassment. It is an embarrassment. Literally, you couldn't, de you couldn't design a less diverse set of firms, and that's what we have. The good news is that the owners and the founders and the principals of these firms know it, and they're starting to change. It's just taking a lot longer than it should take. Ursula, every journey starts with a single step, so we wish you well with that. Uh, and progress, as you say, needs to be made. Can I talk a little bit about something else that may not be sustainable as well? Uh, and that is the current valuation picture. We've just seen a super hot inflation number out of the United States. Rates are expected to go higher. What impact do you think higher rates are going to have on the private equity industry and the valuations that are currently being ascribed to assets? And I think that right now we are in a superheated mode. We've been there, unfortunately, for probably five to seven years, and it's just not cooling down at all. Every year that we think it's going, something is going to impact it, we thought the pandemic would. Actually, it's come out of the pandemic, pandemic even hotter than before. So in normal times, I would say that inflation would have a negative or a chilling effect, but I, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. We've been riding a wave, we meaning um, industry, right? Investing has been riding a wave for 15 years now that literally I, something has to stop it, something has to to adjust the valuations because now they're at the point, anything that's called tech enabled, that trades on, I love this, trades on multiple of revenue. They have a multiple of yeah. revenue. Mm -hmm. But good news is Integrum is not in that space, but it's a very big challenge right now. I don't believe that inflation is gonna be the, the cooler of that. I think something else has to happen structurally to slow down this wave that we're on. Yeah, Ursula, hi, it's Alex in New York. Um, yeah, all you have to do is look at Rivian today, uh, maybe opening at about 120. Um, I wanted you to put on your Xerox hat for a second. Uh, yesterday we saw the, bre the breakup of GE spinning off into three parts. You ran a huge company and you made acquisitions as CEO of that company. Do you feel like the era of the big conglomerates in the U.S. is over and what does that do for competitiveness for U.S. business? Yeah, I think that capital intensive conglomerates are waning now, but we still don't lose sight of the fact that we have massive conglomerates in softwares, software and services. So yeah, it's just a different way to look at, at size, a different type of size. So I think that uh, technology Conglom All right. Conglomerates on capital intensive business, I think, are slowing down, but on tech businesses, I think not. Thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, your time. Uh, Ursula Burns, Integrum founder, and Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you for bringing that interview to us as well. This is Bloomberg.
It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash. A look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. Mariska Gupta. General Electric has launched an offer to buy back as much as $23 billion of debt. The company is on target to cut its borrowings by more than $75 billion in the three years through next month. Yesterday, GE unveiled a plan to split the corporation into three separate companies. About a quarter of financial services firms plan to cut jobs in New York City in the next five years. According to the partnership for New York City, that was the highest share of any industry survey. Just 20 28% of the city's 1 million office workers are back on an average workday. Employers expect that to rise by about 50% by the end of January. And that is your business flash, Guy Alex. All right. Thank Thanks you so much, much Vidika. Oh, jinx. Um, so, uh, Guy, I do think that that is quite interesting because the, I think the question that Mayor-elect Eric Adams is going to really confront with New York City is how do you get people back in the offices, the people who still have jobs, and what happens when those jobs are actually reduced? That has a profound effect among rents, among shops, among, you know, yeah. uh, Pret-a-Manger, whatever you take it. I think that's going to be an enormous <laughs> issue and going to take a very long time to suss out. Yeah, and you've got to get all the infrastructure right around that. You've got to make people feel safe. You've got to make people feel comfortable with the idea that they can make that journey from their homes to the office. And I think Eric Adams has certainly, as you say, got his work cut out for him. It's, it's been a narrative here in London. We're starting to see people coming back. Uh, but again, we're nowhere close to being full. Uh, and you wonder kind of... We, we saw an initial spike and then we're starting to, to fade it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be interesting as we go through the winter whether people want to stay tucked up at home or whether they actually do want to come into the office. But as we've discussed in the past, Wall Street is, is a concept rather than a place now. You can be anywhere. Florida, yeah. Texas, you name it. A lot of them that are in Florida. Exists. Yep. Yep. Um, are they going to be in San Francisco? Well, we're going to be in San Francisco coming up. Mary Daly, San Francisco Federal Reserve uh, President, joining us next. Exclusive interview. This is Bloomberg.